Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Emily Sexton. Thank you so much for coming to this talk on a Thursday lunchtime. I think the kinds of people who make space for inspiration and politics and art on a Thursday lunchtime are definitely my people. So I'm really glad to see you all all here. Um, I am the head of programming for the Wheeler Centre, and that's what I'm doing sitting in this chair. Um, I also would like to acknowledge that we're gathered today on uh, the lands of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to any elders past and present, and as well as any other Indigenous people who are joining us today. Um, thank you, Melbourne Fringe, um, first and foremost, for making this all possible. Um, uh, we're going to be chatting with Debbie and Andy for about uh, 40 minutes, and then I'm going to invite um, contributors for, on questions from the audience. Um, and particularly, we have some of our um, Australian local artists who've been working with these guys over the last two weeks, um, so it'd be great to hear from them in particular. Um, but the people that I have with me today are Deborah Pearson and Andy Field. Debbie is a live artist and playwright. Her work has toured to four continents and 15 countries and has been translated into five languages. She recently published The Future Show with Oberon Books and is the founding co-director of UK artist collective Forest Fringe. She's won awards for her solo practice and her work with Forest Fringe, and they include three Herald Angels, a Scotsman's Fringe First, a Peter Brook Empty Space Award, and a Total Theatre Award for significant contribution. She has a PhD in Narrative in Contemporary Performance from Royal Holloway, where she was a Reed Scholar, and she's an associate artist with Volcano in Canada and a resident artist at Summer House Studios. Is that all still true? Yeah, Summer yeah. Set House Studios. Debbie, oh, good. that's okay. such an impressive CV. <laughs> Um, well, some of it you share, Andy. He, Andy is a theatre maker, a curator, and a co-director of the performance collective Forest Fringe. Um, he's toured his own contemporary performance work across the UK and internationally. And he writes on performance and in 2012 completed his PhD on imagining new relationships with the New York avant-garde scene of the 1960s. Hey, guys, thank you for coming. Please welcome... So my first contact with Forest Fringe was way back in 2011, and I was sharing a room with Vanessa Pygram, who, like me, is Melbourne Fringe alumni. And I landed on the hotel room floor at 3 a.m., breathless, my legs wouldn't work, um, my mouth wouldn't work, and I was covered in glitter. Um, and I was invited to speak at some kind of unconference, I think, that was being run, and I was a total righteous brat. I um, addressed these incredibly polite and generous English people as the coloniser. Um, I mean, it's fair enough. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but it, but it, I got this sense that speaking provocatively and honestly was sort of the vibe. Um, and since that time, uh, my love and admiration for these two and the kinds of people that are within their orbit has grown and mutated and deepened significantly. And I'm delighted that they're back in Melbourne here again, um, as I find their wisdom and their rigour really exciting. Um, now, in, in a lot of ways, Forest Fringe is sort of kind of just a small outfit that roams the world um, doing residencies and micro festivals and with a semi-regular group of sort of misfits and, and outstanding misfits, I guess you call them. But um, the, prin the principles by which they do those residencies are, are really far more reaching and, and it's those ideals that I want to talk about today because I think they're really applicable and invigorating for the kinds of ways we can understand making work here, if you're an artist, or the way you understand making seeing art as an audience member. And I also think it has a great resonance for the political climate that we face together as artists and as citizens. So um, I wanted to ask you, because uh, when you were beginning this venture as a collaboration, and at that time there were just two of you, what the values were that, um, and that saw the creation of Forest Fringe about 10 years ago, and, and how those values relate to what you're doing today? Uh, well, the creation of Forest Fringe actually came about because a anarchist cafe in Edinburgh called the Forest Cafe, which was like a free art space that everyone could put work on freely in Edinburgh, and it was also a vegetarian volunteer-run cafe, had a very beautiful space upstairs in Edinburgh, 
and they wanted to turn that space into a venue during the Edinburgh Festival, but they had some very specific caveats around how they wanted that space to operate. So they wanted to make sure that nobody was being charged any money, that included audience members and artists, and they wanted to ensure that the space would not have a number on it, that it would not be part of the official fringe brochure because they really found all of the commercialization around that quite abhorrent and anathema to what they were doing. And they also wanted it all to be volunteer run. And funnily enough, when I was 24 years old and then I was asked if I could bring some of my theater making cohorts into the building, some of those things seemed like inconveniences at the time or like they maybe delegitimized us or made it difficult for us to seem more professional. But then as we kept going, those did become the core tenets of the way that we operated. And once Forest Fringe kind of moved on from the Forest Cafe, those tenets remained at the center of everything we did. So those values that you had at the moment, that at that time were a kind of a, a spirit of anti-commercialism, of, um, of contributing, I guess, volunteer labor to something bigger than yourselves. Mm. Uh, were there any other things that you think now are, are, are quite relevant to your practice and the way that you understand your work? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that free accessible programming was a really important yeah. and relevant element. And I think also making sure that the politics of the work that we were making space for was also as kind of accessible and welcoming as possible. I mean, mm -hmm. I can remember Forest Cafe back in those early days asking us to consider working with like anarchist artists, for example, and also saying like it would maybe be for the best if we didn't go with incredibly commercial comedians who were making really sexist and racist jokes and who maybe would draw very large audiences but were sort of quite aggressive presences to have in that particular space. And I think that we've sort of internalized a lot of that in a, a really liberating and exciting way going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting how now having left that space at the Forest Cafe, and the Forest Cafe continues, uh, but they had to move to a much smaller space because of the 2008 crash. We've sort of been able to take a little bit of the spirit of what that cafe had always been about and bring it into our projects going forward. Mm -hmm. And what are those projects now? At the moment, um, well, we're, I, I know, we're sort of, we decided last year that we didn't want to do the Edinburgh Festival anymore because, uh, you know, for lots of reasons. I mean, it's a horrible place <laughs> and we, uh, you know. Ed Edinburgh's a nice place, but the festival. Uh, Edinburgh's a lovely place. <laughs> it's got a great castle, all yeah, kinds of beautiful. things. But like the, the festival just kind of grinds you down after a while. And whereas I think when we started doing the festival, we felt like we were finding ways of, of hacking that festival and creating kind of radical potential within a kind of, you know, ocean of commerciality. By the end, it felt the other way around. It felt like the festival was sort of hacking us and that the, the, the increasingly those things that we thought we were doing that were radical were actually kind of ways of sort of perpetuating or extending the, the sort of the, the, the commercial reach and success of the festival. Um, and also like we're older now and you know you can't sleep like seven to a room anymore. So, um, so we're, we're kind of going through a process of reconfiguring what it is that Forest Fringe like what is the heart of what we do as an organization? And, um, uh, and always we've had this, this thing in Edinburgh that we all do, that we do for free, that, that we do for free, that the artists do for free, that is free to an audience, that is trying to suggest, even in this kind of utopian sort of imaginary way, an alternative value system, an alternative community, an alternative kind of space. Um, and saying, well, if we're not going to have that there, then what, what other th entity can we kind of embed at the heart of all of the other, you know, slightly more kind of quotidian things we do? And, or Ira, our co-director, put it perhaps best when she said, you know, <laughs> if all that time each year that we spend making this festival, this venue in Edinburgh happen, like, if we, like what else could we do with that time? So we're just beginning to try and answer that question. And the way that we're doing that is that we've started a free monthly uh, art club, 
in London called the Amateurs Club, which the idea of which is it's a place where professionals of all kind can go to be amateurs, where we celebrate our amateurishness. Uh, Debbie described it really beautifully as like a factory where we don't know how to use any of the machinery, um, but we're kind of figuring out how the moving parts work. And we're using that monthly club. Or, or like I, I kind of think of it as like an after-school club mm -hmm. for people that aren't in school anymore. <laughs> So we're using that as an opportunity to kind of figure out what are some of the other things that we would like to use, the kind of platform and the, the, the kind of cultural capital that we've developed to, to, to do. Mm -hmm. So we might make a film, um, like we're beginning to explore. Um, next, this, next month I'm doing one which is about public space and about trying to reclaim and protect um, the, sort of the, the democratic potential of public space in the city. We might try and like build a house. I don't know. Start we don't a political know. party. We Start made like a, a list of things that sounded crazy enough for us to try to do without knowing how to do them. Yeah. Uh, operate a television station. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, for both of you, this isn't the first time you've been in Melbourne. Um, in fact, Debbie, you did a some of your degree here. Yeah. That's right. I, yeah, yeah, I did at the University of Melbourne. Yeah. Um, and I know that. Uh, context is really important to you when you're making work. So I was wondering what you were thinking about when you were preparing for this time as part of the Melbourne Fringe Festival. Hmm. Well, I mean, I'm very aware of the ways that Melbourne seems to have changed and to be changing really quite rapidly. I mean, the last time I was here was 2014, and even then it feels like it's changing quite quickly. And we are in Footscray, which is a neighborhood. Like, you can feel Footscray changing beneath your feet, weirdly. Um, so I think that we've been very aware of that and gentrification is something that's come up a lot uh, during our the first week of our residency, certainly. Um, and as someone, I lived in Brunswick in 2004. So Brunswick is, I can't recognize like anything. You know, you wanna have that walk down memory lane and I go to Brunswick and I'm like, nope, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that any of this neighborhood is at all what it was in 2004. Uh, so I think we're certainly aware of that, but of course that's a process that's happening all over the world, um, and that's something that we've been trying to think through, particularly our position as artists in that context, in that rapidly gentrifying context. Um, how can we be artists responsibly and effectively, and how can we uh, respond to that rapid gentrification in a way that isn't necessarily perpetuating it? Do you have an answer to that question? No, but we've no. been thinking it through. Yeah, uh, yeah no, not, not really. Yeah, I mean, I think partly we've been thinking about the idea of sort of, well, we've been working quite a lot in public space and thinking about kind of different paradigms for working in public space. And there is this whole kind of lineage from like the flaneur through the situationists of essentially just like, just like white dudes watching people do things, and um, and and this kind of this assumed neutrality or this assumed distance from the life and activity of a place, um, you know, the idea that a, a city or a community can be something to be looked at rather than lived in, and but also I, that you could stand on the side of a, a sidewalk and no one would uh, presume the worst of you. Yeah. That's a white or the, person's You know, yeah, it, it right. rests on that whole notion. And like, you know, I, I, in my past, I've made lots of like work that has sort of celebrated and, um, and kind of been a little bit in love with this idea of trying to appear invisible and using the city as a canvas and all of that um, stuff. Um, but that, that seems to, you know, that presumes a certain privilege that you can stand there and no one will notice you. You can loiter and no one will even question your right to be there, right? So I, I think that we're, we're trying to... Um, trying to find a different paradigm, uh, one which recognises our status as outsiders and as uh, recognises our difference and certainly you know, one that recognizes the baggage that we carry. And, you know, you, you are very, I feel very aware of the baggage that I carry as a British person arriving in this country in order to, you know, make things here. I mean, that's deeply problematic. But, um, 
yeah, that recognizes that and recognizes the space that you take up and finds a way to begin from there rather than assuming your uh, mm. separation from that. Um, I'm going to join these two questions in a minute, but I wanted to ask you, having um, toured quite a lot globally and now being here in Melbourne, what a, f what a fringe festival is now and, and, um, and are they useful for artists? That's such an interesting question because we took Forest Fringe to Toronto in the Progress Festival in January of last year and we basically received the equivalent of like a cease and desist letter from the official fringe of Canada. <laughs> Because um, the word fringe has been they've copyrighted, copyrighted it. Yeah. in Canada. So you can't use the word fringe because there's this assumption that then it's a bit like the Calgary fringe or the Montreal fringe or the Toronto fringe. So all the fringes ganged up on us and sent us an angry letter <laughs> saying, come fucking come to our town. And <laughs> yeah. It just seemed like such a hilarious, I mean. Wow, it how just, did we get there? Yeah, That's absolutely. Bad. That the word fringe yeah. itself should be copyrighted and then should be like should become and something owned. you can get a cease and desist letter for you. I'm using. just looking at Simon, the head of the fringe in the audience, to see if he's also copyrighted fringe. <laughs> no? Good. I think someone who is, embraces the idea of art is everything is unlikely to, <laughs> to sort of go down that road. Um, yeah, no, it, it is interesting. Um, uh, I think, well, I mean, as, as, as we're working with. Dan, who, Dan Coop, who's the producer at the Fringe, and as he keeps saying, um, Melbourne Fringe is very different to some other places, most other places who ha that have a Fringe, uh, in that the Fringe came before the official festival, and that, as that, in that sense, the Fringe doesn't really, isn't really about being on the edge of some large institutional entity, but is about, uh, about the artists, I suppose, and is about being a kind of artist-led project and I think that that's good that this the Melbourne Fringe here is still interested in that and still aspires to that mm. as an idea uh, because I don't know how common that is now you know that the 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 the, the, the uh, I mean certainly in Edinburgh I think it would be a it would be, <laughs> it would be a push to say that the that the fringe still places artists at its center. Mm. I mean, the other thing we've been thinking about in terms of fringe is the fact that, you know, there is often this um, notion of open access, right? And that, that it is the most democratic kind of festival as a consequence. But the, there's two problems with that. One is that that open access has all these invisible barriers to participation. Um, some obvious ones like in Edinburgh, I mean, it's wonderful that our talk today is being signed. Um, in Edinburgh, they're about like less than 5% of the shows of the festival are signed. Mm. Most of the venues don't even have wheelchair access, right? So that's a barrier to participation. But also the fact that it costs, you know, between like five and 20,000 pounds to like make a show happen, right? It, that's a version of open access that probably only, you know, American Republicans would understand, right? <laughs> so I've just come back from the Dublin Fringe where um, Irish sign language is not a formally recognised language. Mm. And that, I know, wow. I really, it profoundly shocked me. It's still something that the deaf community is fighting for, mm. which was a show within the festival, but it, I, I was gobsmacked. I mean, to give Andy a little bit of credit here, when we were doing, the first year that we did uh, the Accessibility Day, it was very, I mean, we, we both agreed to do it, but it was very much Andy's baby and Andy's project, and he made it happen. And uh, this last year, I was on a similar panel discussion like this that was hosted by the official Edinburgh Fringe. We're no longer in Edinburgh. And they had an accessibility officer who immediately rushed up to me afterwards and said that she basically just has a job mm. because of the accessibility days that we were running, because that was sort of what brought accessibility into the conversation for the Edinburgh mm. Fringe Festival, which is... Sad. It's completely stupid that that was us that did that. We're not even part of the fringe. We're so under, sure. like we were so under resourced. We weren't part of the yeah. fringe. We just, you know, we just did it because a friend of ours who worked with a theater company who worked with um, deaf artists came up to us and basically told us the situation at the Edinburgh Festival, and we were like, oh well, obviously we have well, to do what stupid. we can <laughs> to help that. Yeah, we were like, she was, and she was like, oh, it's so nice to hear you immediately say yes. And we were like, well. 
what we're not jerks. Like, why wouldn't we say? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, I can't believe people aren't saying yes yeah. to this. Um, yeah. So I want to connect, um, and this this is a, a, a tenuous one, but I think I, I wanted to ask you guys about populism, and I think there is an irony or a strangeness in that artists are people who are used to being on the fringes of the mainstream and yet in current politics worldwide we've seen this new and different kind of emergence of people on the fringe and the kinds of um, uh, power and influence they then can occupy. And I'm wondering within the broad sweep of ideals and idealism that you guys approach with your work how we approach all of that with empathy. <laughs> Did it, was there a con connection there? <laughs> yeah. So how we approach... People who are on other fringes to us, I guess. Yeah. You know, empathy. like if you imagine a fringe, it's more like a circle, yeah. I guess, of, you know, of, there's all sorts of people at the outer of things. And we've, there's, a, there's a kind of outer that we are agreed upon, and, there's the, and then there's another kind of outer. Mm -hmm. And how do we... Uh, making a connection with the kinds of experiences we have of being on the fringe to people who are on the fringe in a different way. I mean, I think so much of it is about like not just sharing your platform, but sometimes stepping off that platform and asking someone else to step onto it. Which is an interesting segue to a project that you did as part <laughs> of the Next Wave Festival in 2014, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Which was about getting into a canoe with a conservative voter. <laughs> And, yeah. and asking them about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, asking us to have an honest conversation about politics that wasn't an argument. But you know, it's interesting because I really couldn't do that project now. I'm just yeah. too angry, yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the thing that sometimes some people you shouldn't approach with empathy. Like sometimes you just really need to punch Richard Spencer in the face and like, <laughs> That's a legitimate... Or that's nut a le the sea bomb in Australia, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just like nut Tony Abbott. Like, sometimes that just needs to be done. Because does it? Yes, it does. Yeah, I think because there's a good use for... Like, I think hate speech is a very useful word when we're talking about freedom of speech. It's good to be like, there's freedom of speech, and then there's hate speech. Uh, the same way that there's, like, freedom of movement, and then there's physical violence. Uh, and actually, physical violence is not appropriate, even if we are free to move in other ways. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yes. But I think that, you know, like, I don't know, it, it, there are, it's not just that the, those, uh, those positions are not just opposed positions, right? That, that, I mean, it's like the idea that, yeah, that, that, that actually the, the position of being like a right wing white supremacist is that you want to eliminate people who aren't like you, you know, people of color and uh, trans people and gay people, you want to eliminate them. And that actually it's not, an, you know, that in some instances empathizing with those people is not appropriate, resisting them is appropriate. Um, it's an interesting example, there was a show at the festival, Edinburgh Festival this year by a wonderful artist that we've worked with before called Selena Thompson, uh, who is a, 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 a black British artist um, who made an incredible show called Salt, which was about a journey she took that, uh, that, that retraced on shipping, on, on um, container ships, uh, retracing the transatlantic slave routes from Bristol to uh, the, uh, West Africa and to Jamaica and back again. And um, her desire to do this and to make a show out of it was born of an experience that she'd had at the Fringe a few years before, actually when she'd been artist in residence at Forest Fringe. And um, she had gone to see this show that was by a white artist, actually, ironically, another artist that Forest Fringe had worked with, um, that was where he was trying to empathize with and find you know, and, and, and it was all about a dialogue. It was called Confirmation. It's a piece by an artist called Chris Thorpe. And um, it was all about trying to find dialogue, trying to find space with uh, a white supremacist. And Selena sat there as a... She t sell, tells this monologue in, in her new show that she sat there in the audience as pretty much the only non-white face in the audience of a show where a white artist is trying to empathise with a white supremacist. And she was 
in bits. She was in bits because she was like, this is not, you know, this person just wants... This isn't constructive. Yeah, this person wants, to, wants me wiped off the face of this country, if not this earth. How, you know, I don't want to have a dialogue with this person. I want to feel, feel protected from them. Mm. And the fact that we are sat in this room having this conversation feels horrible to me. So, you know, I, I try and... Uh, I try and listen to voices like that when they're telling me that um, that they don't want us to empathize with people who want them dead. That said, <laughs> there were no white supremacists in my canoe, I should point sure. out. I mean, it was, yeah, con true. it was just conservative voters, you know, mm -hmm. people who voted for the Liberal Party in Australia, which is quite a different thing. And it was useful to understand their perspective. Um, but I... I think I did that project again in Belgium and I ended up asking, I was in the canoe with um, a guy who voted for a Christian party and it seemed like we agreed on everything. Like I didn't really, I kept wondering like, why are you even in the canoe? Like we agree on the environment, we agree on labor laws. And so finally I asked him about abortion and he was like, oh yeah, it's murder, it's murder. And uh, that was the moment that I was like, oh, this is a really hard project. <laughs> Mm. Like this is a really, now I have to have a conversation with a 19 year old boy uh, who has suggested to me that he's having sex outside of marriage with his girlfriend about the fact that he thinks abortion is murder. That's really not going to be an easy chat. Um, but it was useful. It was interesting. I think neither of us had talked to someone before who disagreed with us mm. on that particular topic as vehemently as we disagreed with each other. Yeah, so there was something to be gained from it. But I think maybe I'm just feeling too emotional about the politics in this country, or not in this country, in this world right now, to be able to enter into that project, even though I still recognize the legitimacy of it. Mm. It is interesting, though, that you make that connection between kind of mar marginal artistic practices and, um, and, and other kind of perhaps more controversial marginal positions. Um, it just reminded me of the uh, documentary by Adam Curtis um, where he, he suggests, I mean, you can take everything that Adam Curtis says with a pinch of salt, right? But he seems to suggest that the kind of mastermind behind um, uh, Putin's government in Russia is a, like, former performance artist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that actually the strategies of performance art are being employed on a kind of... Um, you know, geopolitical scale by Putin's, uh, Putin's, uh, Putin's team. So maybe, you know, maybe, maybe we all have to be, uh, you know, aware of... Uh, I don't know, but I think that there's value in asking the question, I guess, and, fi and I'm glad that you guys gave the answers that you did because I, I, I don't want to empathise with white supremacists either, ever. But I guess um, reaffirming why not um, is an important process to go through sometimes. Um, I wondered to um, how you. Go, I wanted to ask you guys about Brexit, and what strategy? Yeah, <laughs> what strategies you've seen amongst your UK arts colleagues that have impressed you? In when when because the Australian arts environment um, had a degree of uh, experience with what it means to have the rug pulled out from beneath you and and everything. Um, get raided overnight, which is how it felt when George Brandis, um, you know, took money away from the Australia Council and um, co-opted it into the Ministry of Arts. Brexit is that on a much larger scale. And so, I, yeah, I was curious about when you've looked around at what the responses have been amongst your colleagues, what, what you've seen that think, you think are good strategies and perhaps what you think are bad ones. Um, I, think something that, I think something we did, which was quite good, was <laughs> we uh, immediately after Brexit, it was sort of a weird coincidence, but we had applied to do a residency in Europe about British, like uh, a British artist-led collective's relationship to artist-led collectives in continental Europe. And we didn't think Brexit was gonna go through. And then Brexit went through and it was horrible. And I also knew, oh, we're definitely gonna get that money. <laughs> because they're gonna look at it and be like, oh, something that actually didn't seem, that might've seemed like a bit of a stretch and who cares, now actually seems really relevant and yeah. urgent. Um, so we did go over and we did this residency uh, and we met a lot of other continental European <sighs> companies, I guess. And it was interesting to hear in Brussels their perspective on Brexit because really the perspective we heard was that the UK had been like the difficult kid in the class 
And, uh, and now the difficult kid was leaving and they were sort of like, well, good, because you've been vetoing a lot of really important legislation in the EU, which was an interesting perspective to hear. Um, and we also tried to make a piece in response to Brexit that we presented to like five people in a bar in Brussels. That was nice. Um, <laughs> but in terms of other, other strategies, I think that there's a lot of work being done now between EU organizations and British artists and British organizations to try to strengthen those relationships. And I think weirdly, because they're under threat, everybody is now realizing how important they are and mm. how important those working partnerships are. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's interesting, right? Because, I mean, yeah. I've, yeah, I've spoken to a lot of Brits, who's, uh, arts colleagues in Britain who are like, I'm still in denial. Yeah. 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 I mean, it might not happen. I saw a, <laughs> I saw a statistic that said that if we can wait until 2021, then a uh, enough of the kind of population will have died of natural causes that the waiting of the sh the uh, the vote will have uh, pushed to the other side. So, you know, <laughs> if we can just keep stalling for another four years, we'll be fine. It's entirely possible. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's, but having said that, right, that um, the general election last year was one of the most um, kind of unexpectedly hopeful moments in politics that I've had for many years. You Even know? though it didn't really 100% work out. I mean, you know, it's, yeah, who knows what's happening now? It's just like, it's just chaos. But, the, 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 you know, there was this assumption that, that it was going to unfold in a certain way and it didn't. And, um, and one of the things that I really noticed in the build up to that election was the number of people, both artists and just my friends in general, who were for the first time like getting out and face to face and knocking on doors. And me too, I'd never done it, you know, for all of my, you know, like rhetoric about being political and such like I'd never like gone canvassing at all and I was there like you know knocking on neighbors doors and handing out leaflets um, and all that kind of thing but everyone was like so many people that I saw you know it was real it felt like this was a real sea change in not only in people's desire to engage politically but in people's understanding that that engagement had to happen face to face that that had to it was about that interpersonal connection and um, Particularly with younger people, actually, like yeah. a lot of university students turned yeah. up to vote that the Conservative Party were not banking on getting votes from. Well, they didn't get the votes. Mm. The Labour Party did, which was and great. I, and I guess that's you know, in terms of like you know that in terms of that confirmation or that desire to sort of understand why why life before in an era where you know of of, of mass communication via the internet and and you know, and, and television and such, like why live performance still has value and still has kind of political efficacy, that felt like a really resonant moment, you know, to see the, the importance of people getting out and having conversations one-to-one, -one, face to face, hitting the streets. And like, I know that, um, that there's an event here for marriage equality on Saturday morning where people are gonna be coming mm. and just calling up and making those conversations and mm. having those interpersonal connections. And uh, I think that that, 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 that that understanding of our, our need to engage with these issues on that kind of really fundamental grassroots level is something that I think is happening in the wake of Brexit, because I think we all got very complacent. And do you think that's, um, I guess, where the skills and the um, experiences of artists like yourself kind of come into the fore, because right. you are, a, you know, artists are adept at interpersonal relationships, they are adept at flyering, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they actually know the value of, of kind of, I guess, a meaningful connection in a room like this. Yeah, they've reached a sort of, you know, a point where they can no longer be embarrassed by things. So that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think so. But I also think about, you know, the ways in which art can facilitate other kinds of like interpersonal connections, you know. So, um, you know, there's a, a piece that I've been making for a couple of years now or making versions of in different parts of the world, which is uh, a one-to-one -one performance for one adult audience member and one child performer 
about the future of the city that they inhabit together. And one of the aims of that project is to facilitate a kind of conversation between people within positions of power and sort of governance within a city and these children who have very strong and often, you know, quite um, provocative opinions on, you know, what the future of that city should be. And so, you know, art, you know, art becomes a way of legitimizing the space that enables that conversation to happen, you know, legitimizing the voice of those young people and, and getting sort of city councillors and some mayors and architects and other people of influence to actually sit and have a conversation that they might not otherwise have. And, um, and so I think that art can often be, and, and performance in particular can be a space that can kind of facilitate, mm -hmm. can hold open the space for conversations that, that go beyond what can simply happen on the street and, and through that kind of regular canvassing. Yeah, that's what I meant by um, sharing the platform or sort of stepping off the platform because I think sometimes as an artist you also construct a certain kind of platform where people will be listened to differently and maybe people who are not listened to as frequently like children, for example, in Andy's piece will be mm -hmm. listened to uh, more carefully. And I think that that's such a, I think that's like, not just the best way to empathize, it's like the best way to listen. It's just mm -hmm. the best way to be like a curious person in this world who's listening. I remember years ago, Andy, I interviewed you for Real Time and I, I guess a quote, a, a thing that you said sort of um, sticks out to me where you, I, I'm pretty sure you said something like, art is something you do, something that happens to you. Yeah, it sounds like something, <laughs> something I'd like say. That. Um, I say a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's like a very answer. <laughs> yeah. But I'm wondering the balance between this very kind of purposeful art that you're describing and then the sort of really sublime, immersive, I don't know, I can't articulate what, what's kind of wondrous about it, kind of art that you might see if you go and see a Rothko painting and what those, t those sort of more and less purposeful, purposeful versions of art look like for you guys and how those two things come together. So I'm still totally on board with the Rothko painting. However, <laughs> in 2017, I'm also really preoccupied with who is allowed to make that painting. Yeah, Do you correct. know what I mean? Like, yes. uh, and how many white men we have who've gotten to, who have had the opportunity to make the like objective work about the human condition yeah. and actually putting more paintings that are maybe as sublime and beautiful and just about the human condition as this Rothko painting is, but that's not necessarily by the same demographic that we've always seen that work come from. Great. Good. Um, we are just going to um, go a couple more things, so get your questions ready. Um, and yeah, hi, Ashes. So they will come to you if you have a question, so stick your hand up. But, but um, so while you're thinking about those, Andy, I, at the very last minute, asked you to read a very yeah, old piece. Yeah, but I lost it. I don't know where oh, it is. Oh, no, it's true. Yeah. Lucky for me, there's oh. one right here. <laughs> Good. Um, this is something that you wrote in 2010. <laughs> yeah, is that it right? Yeah, a really long time ago. Really long time ago, but I think it's still actually more beautiful and relevant than ever, and it might just propel us into uh, the next kind of conversation. Okay. This was something that I wrote. So in 2000 and, yeah, when this was, 2010, there was, um, we had a nice talk, it's really interesting talking about kind of exactly what we were just talking about, about making space for other people and about the way that art can kind of facilitate a certain kind of um, space for dialogue and exchange. Um, we have an artist, an artist called Lucy Ellinson who was someone that we worked with a lot of Forest Fringe, and she said that she wanted to make this project happen uh, in Edinburgh called One Minute Manifestos, where she would like paint a white square on the floor, and anyone could come up and say something, say just say something they believed in for one minute. And we used to do this in the evening before, um, it, while people were queuing for uh, our evening show, which was a, a, pro, a show called Hitch by an artist called Kieran Hurley, which was also like about political journeys and about a literal journey from London to Italy for the G8 protest. So it was a real like, it was, I know, it was a moment. It was a, kind of one of those things where you're like, ah, oh, yeah, it's, ah. <laughs> and um, it was just really nice that people, each, people would get up and they would do these, these they would say 
something for one minute. They would say anything they believed in, and then, and it was wonderful. And then we did it in San Francisco, and it was even more because you know it's like Californians, so they were like, ah. <laughs> you know, say anything you believe in, so literally anything. Um, and so I. Um, this was something that I wrote as a one-minute manifesto. And because there's this little screen down here, I'll be able to see yeah, if you're it's, on trial. This see if it's one minute. minute. I'm going to wait because it's <laughs> counting down now to like four, three, two, one. Um, the deed is everything, the glory naught, Goethe. This is the gift manifesto. We live in an age of rampant capitalism, an age when the laws of the market pervade our every interaction, financial, political, social, personal, an age when we can understand our relationship with the world only in terms of value and return, when all is reduced to a commodifiable transaction. There is no alternative, no escape, because this is not simply a system that surrounds us, it is one we embody and perpetuate with nearly every thought and gesture. In such an age, the gift is a radical gesture, a tiny rupture in our understanding of the world, a space opened up to think differently, to exist differently, to relate to each other differently. Giving is a revolutionary act, but we have forgotten how to give properly, so this manifesto is a guide, a guide to radical giving. Do not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is not giving, it is a transaction. Do not pay it forward. This is not giving, it is a balance sheet. Do not give to those in need of your gift, those who will suffer without it. This is not giving, this is common decency. Just give Give indiscriminately, give often, give when nobody asked, give when nobody expected, give in the unlikeliest of circumstances, give to the unlikeliest of recipients, give to those who don't want your gift, give anonymously, give recklessly, give when it inconveniences you, give when it pains you, give in imaginative, radical, impossible ways, give in ways that don't even look like giving. Gestures become strategies, become ways of living. A few well-placed gifts could change the world. Yeah. I was like, a I was like, 40. that was like a minute, a minute forty. So, I, I guess we'll Lucy gave me some leeway on the night. But, I'm glad she did. Yeah. Do we have any questions for Debbie and Andy? Um, from, right down here at the front. Oh, and we'll get to you next, sir. Um, previously, I think entertainment was about um, distraction. You know, performance would take people's minds off the day to day. That seems to be what politics is doing at the moment. <laughs> and I wonder about the, um, the change of place and about performers now having to focus people on the issues behind the scenes. I mean, that's an excellent... I feel like you've just given, given us a very good strategy <laughs> and way to think about art because you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm not sure what I can say to... Well, yeah, I mean, we're sort of through the looking glass, aren't we? Yeah. There was a really... Um, uh, I, I was, I was, I've been following all this... this um, the, the thing with um, the taking a knee in American politics, in the, in, in, in the NFL, in NFL players taking a knee for the national anthem, and, and then... Um, uh, uh, I, I actually have no idea where that's going. It was going to be. It's a funny thing I read on Twitter, but I've forgotten what it was, so I'm not even going to try. Um, yeah, I, I think I think it's partly because um, partly the thing is that politics has become so um, caught up with the kind of spectacle of broadcast media, right? And you know that that's the case when a reality TV star is the most powerful man in the world. And and so you know the 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 the, the politics becomes a kind of spectacle, and so art art is you know art and artists are very used to playing with notions of spectacle and undermining spectacle and finding ways you know finding new paths of uh, intimacy and human connection that transcend the, the, the divide created by spectacle. And I wonder if that's why, um, why art is finding a different connection to politics that isn't, um, isn't understood through the kind of, through the, a, a politics that's not read through the grammar of, grammar of television. And, I, and I, I kind of think maybe that's what I was sort of trying to say earlier on about you know, all of the, this canvassing that people are doing, this sort of face-to-face -face interaction. And 
in Britain, it felt like, certainly with the Brexit vote, that we'd reached this kind of crushing nadir in terms of the disconnect between um, the, the establishment and ordinary people who felt so completely disenfranchised. Yeah. And trying to stitch back together those relationships that we have to one another is, uh, is not going to be achieved through, um, you know, through watching Question Time on a Thursday night. It's going to need something more human scale. I've read about... Um yeah, it's interesting because I, I'm thinking through entertainment and where entertainment is currently. And I think that uh, this is maybe a really inane example, but for those of you who watched Orange is the New Black, the most recent season, a very beloved character dies. Spoiler alert. <laughs> and they die in a way that uh, happens in the United States very frequently. And it was very reminiscent of the way that people have been dying on the news. And it was an interesting moment because it's like representationally, you can see that you can be very upset, get very upset because you've invested in this character and they've, and they've died. Uh, but then what was so radical about it was that you sort of, it sort of woke you up for a second and made you realize like, that's not fictional. Like that's happening, that's happening, that's happening all the time. Uh, and I thought that it was actually very clever. I think that there was a lot of controversy over how they, uh, over that plot point, but I did think it was a clever way for entertainment, weirdly, surreally, to make you wake up to the fact that these things are really happening and that politics, you know, have real consequences on people's lives. Mm. My question for you would be the width of Donald Trump's platform and how you react to that. The width. The width of it. He's got small hands, doesn't he? Yeah. The width it just of looks it. wide because his hands are so yeah. small. His hands are so small. Um, I, it's interesting. I sort of have refused to say his name. I don't like to say his name. It's like Voldemort to me, just he who shall not be named. Um, because I think that the extent to which his name was said was one of the reasons that people were uh, undecided voters were unconsciously primed to vote for him. I think the same could be argued to be true of the Brexit um, because the fact that the leave result has the same name as the referendum had is telling, which is why I applaud the fact that your referendum is called the marriage equality vote coming up. It's not. Uh -huh. Is it not? What is it called? It's called the no equality for anyone vote. Uh -oh. uh, it's not a referendum and it's not a plebiscite. It is a postal survey. Um, and we, the people who vote yes, call it a marriage equality debate, discussion, uh, it, the, the question is about same-sex marriage. And so what is it being referred to in the media as? Uh, same-sex marriage, by and large. Ugh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, no, <laughs> we don't get out. There's, there's, um, there's a really interesting um, essay floating around. I can't remember what it was written for, but it was written by an, an author, uh, a wonderful writer called Tennessee Coates. And I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, is that right? Not a bad attempt. Tanahesi. Tanahesi. Tanahesi goes. Where he talks about, you know, that, 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 that there is this kind of implication that, the, that, that Trump's platform is, is, um, is the working class, working class white vote. That's why he voted. But he quite accurately, you know, he in a very kind of plain and factual way demonstrates that actually it's not, it's the, it's the white vote all the way down. That um, uh, through, and, and you look at the figures and you can sort of see that, that that's absolutely the case, that he won, uh, he won the white vote in every age group, in every sort of social category. Um, and I don't think, I mean, I am, I'm, I'm a performance artist. I'm absolutely not, not in any position to, um, from Britain, uh, to, to be able to kind of reflect to, with any degree of authority on the nature of American politics and on Donald Trump's platform. But I thought that I would encourage people to go and read that essay as a way of um, reflecting on some of the myths that are emerging about where Donald Trump's support comes from and, and, you know, and, and who is to, to blame uh, for, for why he's there. Next question. Hey, um, <laughs> I just wanted to bring up the topic of violence that you kind of touched on because 
I was wondering, like, where is the line between violence and defence? Because, you know, in a situation where there's a person holding a gun over a baby and the mother's there and then she, you know, kicks the guy in the balls and runs away and that is a violent act, the kicking of the person in that kind of situation. So in that sense, the um, we call it defence. But then if someone is emotionally and um, mentally abusing a person, we wouldn't probably use violence against them um, in that kind of situation and, I guess, validate it and say it's okay. But a second kind of part to that question is if we remove violence completely, does it then mutate and distort into something else? Like, is it fair to say that we can have a non-violent situation? And I guess what brought this up is, like, the guy headbutting Tony Abbott, we could say that's like a violent act, but to an extent, is that also an act of defence? I don't know if I worded that very well, but I'm pretty nervous. <laughs> no, that's a, I mean, that's a very difficult question, but it's funny because we were just talking about this in our Airbnb like three days ago. Really? Yeah, we were talking about, you were talking about how there's pro, about how you were reading that book about progress and how like technically we're living through a time that is much less physically violent than it used to be. But we were also talking about how there are other forms of violence that are kind of emerging that aren't necessarily physical. Um, and they're more structural. And then the ways that people are uh, shut out of different kinds of conversations, different kinds of places, mm -hmm. and are a lot more covert. Yes, exactly. Um, so the forces that arise by through which someone like, uh, I don't even know his name, that Hobartian guy um, makes the decision that that's uh, his only choice. Yeah. Um, some people would think that that's kind of legitimate. It's like an act of resistance. I guess so. Yeah, but you're right. Like, it's super complicated. I, 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 think I have lots of um, friends... Um, but that's it. I just have lots of friends. I just want to make that known. No, Good I you. I have lots of friends who are are you know uh, uh, who are very active in um, in sort of anti-fascist politics, I suppose, and um, uh, and those friends have lots of very interesting things to say about the the, the legitimate deployment of violence and. And, you know, as someone, like, I didn't grow up in that context. And actually, you know, as someone who grew up very comfortably and, you know, as a, as a cis white man, um, you know, I, I think I, you know, was able to kind of move through the majority of my young life with that kind of firm belief in a sort of untested pacifism, you know. Um, an idea that sort of violence is never the answer um, because that's what your parents tell you. And that uh, I am going through a process myself of, yeah, trying to interrogate a little more strongly whether that is always the case or not and to try and recognize the instances in which people are kind of invisibly having violence enacted upon them and that they're only legitimate form of resistance to that is another kind of violence. So it's, yeah, it's, it's complicated and I am trying to figure it out for myself by listening to people who uh, are in less comfortable positions than mine. Do we have another question? Hello, it's come up a few times today about um, uh, disconnection and the need for face-to-face -face and one-on-one -on -one and canvassing and and taking away that big screen HD feeling to what we do. Um, I haven't been able to get out to Footscray and see your work, but you guys are obviously tapping into like in like smaller communities or outskirt communities or suburban communities. And I don't know, do you feel like um, you guys are kind of starting to achieve that one-on-one -on -one thing or like do you feel like we need as an army of people to be like splitting off and just doing one-on-one -on -one things? Mm -hmm. I might throw to Stuart, if that's okay with you guys. Yes, please do. Sorry, Stu, to put you in the limelight, but as an artist who lives in the West um, and is also participating in this project, you might have an interesting perspective on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess uh, um, 
for me as an artist living in the West, I haven't been living in the West for that long, but it's been a really interesting time for me to kind of all of a sudden be in a new part of Melbourne and exploring that new place. And um, yeah, I feel like it is really, really important to maintain that kind of like that interpersonal relationship with the community and and how important it is for for art to to reach people face to face in this like you described it like a, a HD kind of feeling that's ha that's kind of like slowly developing in the world and um, yeah and I think it becomes more important than ever to to kind of go out and see people face to face and yeah <laughs> that's uh, yeah. So yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. How do we? How do you achieve that um, with some kind of scale? Yeah. Mm. Mm. I'd, it's not. I'd, well, I'd I mean, not ask that gender. I, the, when you say scale, do you mean like? A, do you mean an economic scale, or do you mean no, the scale of people involved, people, like a movement? Well, um, maybe the latter. Yeah. Yeah. I think that not making it art actually can mm. be helpful. I think that sometimes, like just. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to think that we have to be artists to go into Footscray and engage with people one-on-one -on -one because I don't think you do really need to be an artist to mm -hmm. do that. Uh, or creating a sort of like apparatus for an artwork that everybody feels like they can take ownership over and uh, get involved with. And maybe artwork is the wrong word. Creating an apparatus for a moment of connection that we all feel like we can take part in. Cool. Sounds like a project for Forest Fringe. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I, I mean, in, in, in the UK, I think there's this real shift that's happening in the arts at the moment where there's a sort of a really fundamental re-evaluation of who gets to make art and who is classified as, you know, how, how we understand the, the, the making of art and, and, and a movement towards... Um, you know, really, really broad scale participation. And you can see that in one of uh, sort of particular projects. There's a project called uh, 64 Million Artists, which is created by um, uh, these people, Joe Hunter and David Micklem. And their idea is to embed uh, creativity and art making as fundamentally into our lives as sport is. Um, uh, and, you know, you look at the kind of success that sport has had in constantly emphasizing the Im importance of mass participation. Yeah. Um, that the art perhaps, you know, took its eye off the ball for like 50 years, right? <laughs> and, um, and so there's projects like that. There's also something called Fun Palaces, which started a couple of years ago, which, so, um, the, uh, which was, came out of the anniversary of um, the... I don't know. It was an anniversary associated with Joan Littlewood, who started the um, theatre workshop. What is it called, theatre workshop? I don't know. Uh, Joan Littlewood did this really important community pro community based uh, theatre in the East End of London, Theatre Royal in Stratford, and it was very very legendary um, theatre. And uh, to sort of celebrate her. She had this dream of something called the Fun Palace, which was a place where you know anyone could come and participate in the process of making art together. So Fun Palaces is a project that began a few years ago and is now kind of an annual thing where theatres and other organisations across the country can make a kind of Fun Palace for a day, which is a mass participatory kind of uh, event where everyone is everyone is an artist and everyone is. Uh, participating, so I think there's there's definitely a kind of a shift happening in terms of how we understand how art is made, and that will help with this question of scale. But I think it's also again about the idea that art, um, that, that the work that I make, that is this kind of very small scale one to one work, is about trying to generate. Um, sort of new strategies and new approaches and things that that won't simply that that won't remain sort of circumscribed inside that event that won't be cut off from the rest of the world that those those ideas those strategies for those those the, the big those those um, all the things that are happening in that work will radiate out and uh, you know they will begin to um, sort of shape and colour the interactions that are possible within a community on a larger scale. 
um, so that the art merely it catalyzes. It doesn't need to do the entire job itself. Um, you can see the results of what these guys have been um, creating over the last couple of weeks at the substation at 5 p.m. tomorrow, correct? Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure there are still tickets available if you head online to melbournefringe.com.au. Um, they're free, so just um, go along and, and kind of see the results of this because I think it's a really meaningful dialogue. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks, Andy and Debbie. Thank you for having um, us. A big round of applause for them. Thanks. <laughs> Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.